Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis. This week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at CrossFit Auto Body, located in Union City. CrossFit Auto Body is the perfect place to begin your fitness journey. Come in and become part of the CrossFit community. Visit uccrossfitautobody.com for more information. On today's episode, Scott sits down with Danny Walden, who you might have heard on a previous episode about the missing town of Minglewood, Tennessee. Today, he and Scott discuss the importance of the cotton mill in Dyersburg, Tennessee, beginning in the 1920s until it closed in the early 2000s. And later, learn about something new from Discovery Park of America. I'm Scott Williams, host of Real Foot Forward, where each week we celebrate our little section of the South. And just like at our museum and heritage park here in Union City, we explore the culture, the spirit, the accomplishments, and the heritage of West Tennessee. Today, I'm so excited to have a return guest, Mr. Danny Walden, who's president of Dyer County Historical Society. We're going to talk all about cotton and cotton mills. Welcome, Danny. So, obviously, the role of cotton in in the culture down south is important in many, many different ways. It impacted uh, the culture in Memphis and, you know, all around the Delta. Um, And, of course, we still in culture today have uh, feel the impacts of of the slavery and cotton and you know and so so what what was the role of cotton in the Dyersburg area it's interesting because my time studying the history of Dyer County we we talked earlier about cutting the trees and mingle wood and all that when all those trees were cut then you had a lot of farmland available and so suddenly you've got all these acres and acres of good fertile farmland and farmers are you know, putting crops on it. And cotton was king. As a matter of fact, there was a um, time when king cotton was a, a brand of luncheon meats or something. Of course, I remember Real Foot uh, Packing Company here. Uh, right. I remember I remember king cotton. Yes. And uh, so uh, cotton in Dyer County uh, became a, a major crop for the community, and farmers planted lots of it. As a matter of fact, uh, thousands and thousands of bales of cotton would be uh, harvested in Dyer County in the 30s and 40s. We've learned that there were 17 or 18 cotton gins in Dyer County in 1961, and today there are none. Oh, wow. I and didn't realize that's that. an interesting statistic because we still farm cotton. Uh, Dyer County was once known as the leading county in the state for producing cotton. In 1940, it dropped to number three. Uh, And now I'm not sure that we're doing even uh, 25% of our crops may be done in cotton. It's still there, and there's a lot of it, but the technology's changed, and and even the clothes we wear and how we market that crop has adjusted. And that's where uh, our farmers and our community I had to adjust with the times because well, one one thing that's interesting to me is the way you know so you had the cotton culture down south you had slavery you know the horrors of slavery happening but then you know like in Massachusetts and up up north you had all these textile mills and yes. that's what you know the cotton was going there and then yes. there was even international trade you know happening and so really there was a huge huge culture based on this one commodity that it it really is incredible when you think about how emancipation finally came about because it it did impact many people's pocketbooks. It affected the entire country and the culture of the country. Yeah, you know, and and we're still harvesting cotton today. Uh, but you're right; even the economics of uh, world trade and the fact that cotton, some of the best cotton that's grown, is in the the Delta area around Memphis, and that's really what sparked the people from upstate New York and Michigan to make a decision to come south. Mm-hmm. They want to be closer to where the crops were, where the best cotton was. Well, and what's, so, what's, what's interesting about cotton is, at the time, is, is it was hard to get it out of the bowls. You know, my parents have told me stories of picking cotton by hand and, you know, how, you know, my mom tells how, you know, they would pick cotton and the cotton would actually get uh, red just from their hands, you know, getting bloody from picking the cotton. And, you know, how my mom can tell how her her mother 
was picking cotton and pulling her along on the sack. Yes, you know, absolutely. My dad, you know, shares all kinds of memories, and they do not sound like good memories. You know, very few people say they enjoyed picking cotton, if anybody. You know, it's interesting because as a child, and I'm 68 years old, Mm -hmm. and I picked cotton when I was a kid. Oh, did you? Sure did. Uh, At the same time, I lived in the county, and the county schools would shut down for Mm -hmm. cotton picking season, harvest season. I remember sitting in class in probably the second or third grade, and I remember— after being in school for about six weeks, the teacher started putting paper over the bulletin boards. And I thought, now, why is she doing that? These are attractive bulletin boards for my classroom, and why is she covering them up? Well, that's when I learned that we were going to close school for six weeks oh, and go home. To go pick Because cotton. all those kids and all those people would be part of the harvest because we picked cotton by hand. And my parents, I'm not sure they made me pick. They let me pick, I guess. But... It was an experience that I cherish to this day because I lived in a community that was right across the road from the cotton field. So I'd get up in the morning, go over there, and the dew still be on the cotton uh, stalks, and we would put that sack down, and here we go. Now, I wasn't a very good cotton picker, but I remember, you know, the blood on your fingers where you're picking the cotton because the little burr, when the bowl opens up, it's a little pointy thing there that will get you pretty good. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, families would do that as a group. Teachers would go pick during the uh, harvest season, and migrants would come across the country and go with the the farmers as they harvested as the season came. And you'd see the same migrants each summer. At harvest season, you'd see them again wow. next year. And so you have friends that you'd see just for a brief period of time as you did that. And one of my favorite memories is the fact that most of the time you're doing this in October. That's when the World Series is played. Oh. <laughs> and so as a young baseball fan, uh-huh. uh, the World Series back then, uh, not many stadiums had lights. So the World Series was always played midday. And so I'd always want to go home for lunch so I could find out what the b- score was on a ball, ball game. And, of course, when everybody had lights, they put it on television. It went to, you know, to evening only. Uh, that changed things. Yeah. My memory of the World Series is connected to cotton picking. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. What a lot of people don't realize, probably, if they're not you know from from the South and have, have had people that they know who've been cotton pickers, is a lot of people were sharecroppers. Yes, and so they were farming cotton, but they weren't necessarily making all of the money off of it. The person who owned the land did. So you know, in that time period, the land really was, the landowner really was the the person to want to try to be, to have your own land that you owned and that you farmed. Um, and there were, you know, after a certain number of seasons of growing things, it would start to deplete the soil. And so this area, um, that's one of the things that contributed to no-till yes. uh, farming, which is really big around here Yes, um, and was developed and championed. And today people are still you know, using no-till yes. farming where they leave the nutrients and the soil and, you know, they don't plow it back up again. So right. that's another claim to fame for uh, this area. So um, let's go back to right before the Depression, the Dyersburg Cotton Factory. Is that what a cotton mill? What, what's the right? The name originally was Dyersburg Cotton Products. Okay. Now, the story is that the people in Oswego, New York, and Adrian, Michigan, were considering moving their plants to the south. And their reasoning for doing that was multiple ideas. One was that it got cold up there early on, and before you used electricity to move some of these machines and things, their mills were built over a creek or over a stream, and the paddle wheel would turn the the shafts that would operate the machinery And if it got cold, water would freeze, and therefore you couldn't operate their mill. At the same time, uh, they realized that they could probably have cheaper labor in the south, and they wanted to be closer to the best cotton. So they started looking south. And now now unions were starting to become more active at that time. Did that factor in? Yes, Okay. So basically, it was a factory. Yes. Now, what for, for for people like me who don't really know that much about uh, how cotton goes from the bowl to the shirt that I have on? Um, what were they doing in those mills to the bowls of cotton as they came in? Well, they would first of all gin it, which took the seeds out of it, 
and then they would use the seeds of the places and other things for farming and for nowadays we use it for fertilizer and things like that. But the uh, the people who were in the business would take the fiber from the cotton and spin it into thread. And then once you get it to the thread level, then you can make it into fabrics. And the different types of fabrics would lend itself to how you're going to use it. Do you use it as uh, for socks? Do you use it for linings for a jacket? Fleece that you could basically nap it and put a little fluff on it? Uh, there were several ways they were doing that. And they started looking to come to the South. At the same time, if you think about Dyer County's history, the, co- the, the tree harvesting business was probably on its lower end. Because they had gotten rid That's of right. the trees were gone. Which then creates your farmland. Right. So the farmers are starting to plant things, and cotton was a good commodity that was making some money, and the landowners would want to have grow cotton. Well, uh, Dyersburg, like so many small towns in West Tennessee and in the South, started realizing that you know times were changing. And before chambers of commerce and before groups that would do this uh, professionally um, created a thing that they called the City Club. And the City Club was organized in the 1920s, say 1924 or so. And they started putting together booklets. And these little booklets would have information about the town. And it was a marketing tool. And so they put these booklets together and they would tell about the amenities of this small town the population, the churches, the government, the schools, uh, the transportation, all the reasons why a company might want to come to a rural West Tennessee town. Now, this one you're holding in your hands, about when do you think that was published? What that was year? 1924. And so 1924, and what's uh, tell everybody the slogan there for, for uh, Dyersburg. A little city with a big welcome. See, there, you yes. know, we could use that now. Exactly. You know, all those all those years ago. And well, and, and, and of course, you know, old is new and new is old because, yeah. you know, you kind of rework this thing. Mm-hmm. And I, I take these documents and the things that we learn about this commerce, uh, and it parallels what uh, communities do now to recruit business and industry. Sure. And so it's, it's, it's like a chamber of commerce. And so I didn't know what the city club was until I started doing the research on this company and I thought, that sounds a lot like a Chamber of Commerce, but it was before the Chamber of Commerce became the Chamber of Commerce. Yeah. Uh, in the City Club, uh, these men would go to Chicago or go to New York and try to recruit these companies to come south. And the, the men there, the operated the factories there, were going to come south for those reasons. Cheap labor, electricity, close to the cotton. So And that's, a big welcome. That's right. And, and so a lot of places marketed their, themselves, just like Dyersburg did. And actually, these there was five companies uh, in uh, Michigan and New York that were going to bring their operations south. And they went to Covington, and they went to Bemis, and they came to Dyersburg, and they went to someplace in North Alabama, and they decided, we want to come to Dyersburg. What Dyersburg had done is what towns do today is say, okay, you guys bring your operation here, and we'll give you this amount of acreage out here for this, and we'll make sure we have the sewer system and the water system and the electricity and all that in order for this to, to operate. And they even sold some lots around the plant. And so it was a good deal for the people who owned the factory to come south. At the same time, it was a boom for Dyersburg, and one that would last for 75 years. Wow. So it was a win-win, and the city club was the, I'm going to say, was the Precursor to the, to today's uh, yeah, can modern I, can I see chamber the, of commerce. The brochure that's sure. really interesting. Yeah. You know, of course, I love the way people promote and, yes. and advertise. That's really interesting. Uh, their obje- their um, objective on this document is to build a bigger and greater Dyersburg to locate factories that will employ our people, double the business of every business and professional man who is a citizen of our town to lower tax rates by getting more people here to help pay them. So there you go. It's that simple. And this is from the 20s? Yeah, 1924. Yeah, that's See, amazing. I've got one here that I found from 1926, mm-hmm. and they're recruiting people to come into the city club mm-hmm. because these men are going like, we're business people, and we need to have some help. Yeah. And so this thing says we need a membership of 100 enthusiastic, energetic, well-meaning businessmen who can cooperate to build Dyersburg into a modern city 
it should be and is destined to be. But if we take it, and we need to take advantage of the opportunities that, that are ours. It's the same type thing where you're marketing yourself to try to help the entire community when you bring these plants to Dyersburg. Right. Then those people that were helping to cut trees, you know, in the bottoms, and you know, suddenly the trees are gone. What are you going to do? Um, you mentioned sharecropping too, because some of the people who worked in Dyersburg cotton products when it was first built that are alive today, that are still around, uh, their parents were sharecroppers. So they were on the other end of the cotton industry. And when the mill came, that was a staple because this plant was built in 90 days. Wow. Yeah. And it it was um, a large plant. It was financed through local bonds, and the people voted, you know, to do this, to bring this to Dyersburg. And it really did maintain a lot of families for a long, long time. Well, and I read somewhere, I can't remember where the number of jobs that it created instantly the first day it opened. 1,200. Was, yeah, that's the number, 1,200 yeah. jobs. <laughs> um, can you imagine, you know, if, a, if any industry comes in here yes. to our area and brings 1,200 jobs? Yes. We're all celebrating. Yes. Um, and a lot of these people, imagine they've... Working in the field, working on the farm is the only thing they've known. And so suddenly there's this opportunity. And so what kind of benefits did the mill bring to people who were their employees? Well, one benefit was the fact that if you lived in the area and you wanted to work at the mill, they would provide you a house. And so there was a little uh, section of town just north of the mill and the streets were named after the bosses from the mill. <laughs> there's Wheeler Street. There's Countryman. You know, places like that. And yeah. those names of those streets were the bosses from the mill. And you would provide you a place to live. Now, interestingly enough, the documents that kind of followed all that up were located inside the safe that was used in the mill when it originally came to Dyersburg in 1929. And that safe was donated to the Historical Society, but it was so big and so heavy, we couldn't move it. And so it was inside the cotton mill's basement for years. And then suddenly, several years ago, the mill burned. This is after the mill had closed. And my first thought was, oh, my God, that safe is in there. Mm -hmm. Well, as it turns out, the safe did exactly what it was supposed to do. Because when they got the fire out, we drug the the safe out to the parking lot and let it cool down. It sat out there for four or five months rusting until we found county mayor said, we need to fix that. So he got the county road commissioner to go get it, take it to his shop, sandblasted it. And we hired a locksmith to pick the lock. And we opened that thing up. Now, just imagine, you know, a treasure trove that you're anticipating is your money in here or something. Right, of course. Well, we opened it up, and all the original documents from 1929 were still in there. Wow. And we have those. Oh, that's amazing. And one of those things you mentioned, what does it do for the employees, Mm -hmm. was the outline of what was then called Mill Village. And it had a contract and a drawing of those streets and all the plots for all those houses. And the documents say that 95 homes were going to be built on this land right north of the mill. And they gave the contract to three different contractors. And in the contract, they had to be built of two, three, and four-bedroom homes. And it says, of extremely cheap construction. (laughs) Uh And people would live there. Yeah. And, of course, to go to work, they had a whistle that was a steam whistle that they would blow in the morning to indicate shift changes. And we have that whistle on display at the museum, and we have the, uh, the safe on display at the museum. Well, and so, so you mentioned it was 1929. Yes. When, when they opened. and yes. they, So I'm sure they had great hope and excitement and everything was going to go well. And yes. all of a sudden, boom. Boom. The Great Depression. Yes. And so that must have impacted uh, the, the mill to some degree. It did. The leadership of the mill, uh, the men who ran it, uh, had to make some adjustments because they struggled. Early on, they thought it may not survive. And they invested all this money in this small town, got this big building up in 90 days and did all this. And they had to make some adjustments and change some roles for the leadership. And R.H. Wheeler became... Uh, the boss of the mill, and basically he's given credit for saving it from that Depression-era disaster. 
when I was a young man at Dyersburg High School, I can remember as a senior going to get my hair cut in downtown Dyersburg. And this is 1969, 68, 69. And the men in the barbershop said, what are you going to do when you get out of high school? I said, I'm going to college. No, oh, you don't need to do that. <laughs> and they said, you need to go work at the mill. So that thing survived the Depression. It's been there forever. It's a family business. They have a profit-sharing plan. You know, if you got somebody in your family, they'll get them on too because a lot of family members did work right. there right. and all these different departments. And I look back on that because they said, it'll never close right. because it survived the mill. But what's interesting, uh, the, depression. the Depression, but what's interesting to me is when the economy shifted and the fabric companies, the textile mills, started uh, having competition worldwide. The same things that brought Dyersburg Fabrics, the cotton mill, to Dyer County in 1928-29 are the same things that took it away from us and took it overseas. And see, the, the, it, to understand the impact of that, you really have to understand just how ingrained in the community it was. There was a baseball team. Yes. Um, there was, I mean, there were like community gatherings and, you know, every, every, every aspect of the community was sort of interwoven with the culture of the mill. And you depended upon the leadership of the mill to help sustain even those things during Christmas uh, or if you're doing charity work. Uh, you expected the banks and the industry to step up and help out if you're trying to help underprivileged people or children, uh, those in your community, they were a vital part of all that. And I got to think the mill, knowing its its background and knowing you know the union culture, you know that they had come from in the north, they were trying to keep the unions yeah. from coming in, so they wanted to make sure they had happy staff. Right. So yes. you know, from everything I've read, it does seem like the staff, you know, the people loved working there. They were yes. proud of being there. You know, they got vacation days, high salaries, and yes. they're they're turning that money back into the city. Yes. So it really did just, I mean, it was blossoming because of uh, the mill and the people that got to work there. Um, and, you know, it seems like from everything I've read, there was a lot of pride yes. from the people that worked there. Just, you know, it would appear as though things could not go the wrong direction. Right. And then you started telling us a little bit about what happened what happened next to sort of the first nail in the coffin, if you will? Well, it was it's a competition, foreign competition, uh, cheaper labor elsewhere, you know. And so uh, the people who ran the mill, you know, did everything they could to try to maintain it. And I know that one, one of the uh, uh, situations was that they did some of the work for Patagonia. Yes. And that uh, they provided a lot of the work. And then uh, Patagonia came and said, okay, we're going to give you one chance to bid on, you know, this – product line yes. and they gave it their best shot but it just wasn't enough and so Patagonia went overseas well, see and the interesting thing about that too is that they even during the 90s tried to adjust and so the, the company changed its name from Dyersburg cotton products because they started using uh, these other types of fibers so then they became Dyersburg fabrics mm -hmm. And by doing that, they started to find other ways, you know, with nylons and rayons and things like that to create the clothing that we wear that's so comfortable for us because for a long time you wore cotton. But then as you had these man-made fibers, then that, that were changed. stain resistant. All those things. And things yeah, like that. Yeah, and, you know, wrinkle resistant and all that. At the same time, uh, they even got into the environmental uh, idea by recycling soda bottles. And they took the fabrics, basically, or the, the content of, of old two-liter soda bottles and would re remanufacture that into a, uh, a fabric for children for um, sleepwear, things like that. Then you have these issues where somebody somewhere finds that some of these things are not as, as flame-resistant as they should be. That became an issue, so they had to use chemicals to be able to create what is a safe uh, fabric for children. So... They really tried a lot of things to make that work. And then in the latter years, in the 90s, they uh, 
sold as, as, on the New York Stock Exchange, became Dyersburg Corporation. And now the leadership had moved to North Carolina by that's then, right? right? So, that's right. So they weren't even really there present Correct. in the city anymore. Well, and, and they were on, on occasion, but you could sh- you could feel it shifting. Uh, uh, the leadership was working more out of there, and sometimes even had offices in New York where the Stock Exchange was. Uh, at the same time, there was a, a plant in Cleveland, Tennessee, and, and, and over in, in the mountains, of, the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, so things were shifting, and they were successful for quite a while. Uh, and they even expanded uh, the site in, in Dyersburg uh, with a brand new uh, multi-million dollar uh, high tech warehouse for fabrics and things there. And they would dye them, and they put prints on them, and things like that. So they progressed about as far as they could. Uh, and finally, you know, just the, the cheap labor and, and the competition, uh, they couldn't compete. And so uh, it shut down, I think, in uh, 2001. And do you remember hearing that? I mean, did you anticipate that it was going to be shutting down? Because it was, I mean, being from there, it was really such a big part of your personal culture. Yes, yes. And, and we, we knew that was coming at the same time, and, and we have the, doc, the newspapers and documentation. We even have a recording of the last mill whistle being blown. Oh, mercy. You know, and so it, it's nostalgic to be able to hear that and know that that's when that ended. But some other people bought the building and tried to make a go of it. What you also got to remember, too, is that Dyersburg Fabrics, over the years, opened a mill in Trenton, Tennessee, that's still operating today. Oh, okay. Yeah, and uh, one of the uh, leader's sons runs that over in Trenton uh, and is successful with it. Uh, so there's still remnants of, of that type of industry around. It's just not the dominating industry that it used to be. So what's there now? What is, what, is there a building when, there still? When it burned and we got the safe out and did all that work mm-hmm. on the safe, uh, the building was torn down. And there is uh, the warehouse that was built in the 90s is still there and being used by, uh, I think, uh, Poly One, uh, one of the rubber plants there is using the warehouse. But the actual site uh, is where they're doing a pallet company. Oh, okay. So it's, it's still a functional place there. Yeah. And the, the community is, is kind of uh, not as vibrant as it used to be, but Habitat for Humanity is building houses in the area. Mm-hmm. Uh, our Chamber of Commerce tries to market as much as they can. Of course, it's different in today's world because of the way that you know, factories and industries uh, uh, pick places to put an operation. And they're looking for good labor and a labor force. And they're looking for the same things that the people in Moswego, New York, look for in 1927, 28, 29. Looking for a good deal for energy as well as transportation. And Dyersburg still sitting pretty as far as the, the bridge over the Mississippi River and the train tracks and things and the interstate highways. Sure. Uh, and even the uh, uh, river port down at Lake County uh, benefits Obion County as well as Dyer County. And that, that promises to bring some industry to the area eventually. It's just mm-hmm. going to take some time. Now, now are there still uh, gatherings and reunions of people who used to work in the mill? <laughs> The uh, president of operations is on my historical society oh, board. Nice. I see I see him twice a week. Okay, and uh, he comes in and we talk, you know, at length about those days, and it's good that those people are still around and are actively uh, volunteering in the historical society and helping us to maintain our history. And so those people are there. And a few years ago, we decided we'd like to do uh, sponsor a reunion for uh, those people who worked at the mill. And we had probably 75, 100 people show up. Um, and we brought them to the old uh, high school where the Historical Society meets. And we had slideshows and stories. And we had Jack Todd, who was the uh, president and CEO of the company, come. And he spoke. Uh, Richard Donner, who's the son of, of what used to be the president of Dr. Fabrics, who's running the mill in Trenton, he came and he spoke. And then Albert Falks, who was a operations manager, uh, he spoke. And there were some really good stories. People would get up and talk about stories personally for them. Uh, one dentist uh, got up who was nearing the end of his career. And he said, you know, I came to Dyersburg and said, that factory helped maintain my business because all those employees came to me, you know, for their dental work. And so there were spinoffs that sometimes we don't think about that. 
that these companies and corporations affect all aspects of your of your uh, community life. I bet it was an emotional event for some people. It was, uh, and uh, we have people asking us now um, to do something like that again, uh, and we we try to um, regularly showcase as many of the stories of Dyer County as we can. We're so proud of all those things that happened in the past because, you know, I'm a retired educator, but what I realize is that other people made decisions long before I was even born that affected my life because of these economic decisions and these things to help our quality of life in Dyer County. And so we today should be doing the same thing for our young people Mm -hmm. because those things that, that, benefit your life, uh, we need to have them in our communities, such as Dodgeburg State Community College uh, or these businesses and these um, uh, transportation areas uh, and all the opportunities. We want these kids to not only be well-educated, but you want them to come back and stay home and work and, and raise their family there. And so that's a lot of what we're trying to do. Um, so I understand that uh, you yourself experienced firsthand what it was like to work at the mill. Tell me about that. Yeah, um, when I left Dyersburg High School and started at Dyersburg State, um, I wanted to get married, and I needed a job. And so, did you already have a potential bride? Oh yeah, okay, yeah, so sure did. You I mean, had that taken care of. It wasn't like I was looking. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I needed to work, and so I was able to work at the cotton mill. They had a split shift program, and so I get to work, you know, uh, half a shift. Uh, and they would even work it out for me when I was playing ball at Dyersburg State, going to school there. Then I would go to work at 3 o'clock in the afternoon or even 3 in the morning. And I'd work from 3 in the morning to like 7 in the morning. And I worked in the dye house. And so I was able to experience, you know, that fabric already been woven into these rolls of fabric, and then you had to dye it. And that's what I did. Wow. Um, and it was a good experience for me because it put money in my pocket. It gave me an opportunity to also go to Dyersburg State and play ball. And they even worked with me when we had road trips to go to Chattanooga or someplace like that to play basketball on a road trip. They would let me off work for that. So when and you so, think of it, when you think of the history of it, you don't just think of words on paper. You can almost probably conjure up the smell and the sounds. Uh, and amen, brother. The senses of being there and what it was like firsthand. Yes, and, and the technology of that era because um, uh, the chemicals for the dyeing of the fabrics was one thing. Uh, but then seeing those uh, uh, bales of cotton come in one end of the building and see this fabric going out the other end, going to the warehouse, it was a big operation, and it was uh, – um, I was just born at the right time to be able to see the whole thing start to finish. And now you can see when you drive around, town, you know, drive through the countryside, you can see those big, the way they bail it up now is very different than what they did. Now it's got the big yellow the big, plastic. Yes, and, and, and there's, a, there's a reason why those colors are there. Did you know that? Uh-uh, I didn't. Uh, it d- indicates which gin you're going to go to. Oh, sure huh. does. how and about that? And, and, and even how they pick those rolls up and get it to the, to the cotton gin, uh, there is... The closest cotton gin to Dyer County right now is in Halls, Tennessee. Okay. And I went through that the other day, and it's remarkable how quickly they can pick that cotton and get that stuff through there. Yeah, I I need to put on my bucket list to get into a gin and see exactly what's going on inside there. I've got some recommendations for you. Okay, please. I'm (laughs) going to get them from you. Um, So if I wanted to see some more photos and artifacts and wanted to learn more about this, I have two questions. Number one. Um, what do you have on display and in your collection and, you know, there at the museum? Well, we have the cotton mill safe that kind of starts the story because the fact that, number one, it was the original safe that came in when they first opened the plant. And then those documents about mill, what's today called Mill Town, back then it was called Mill Village, uh, and the people who lived there. But we also have uh, the original documents that give the history of, of the community and how it progressed through as well as that mill whistle. Now, that mill whistle is kind of a unique thing because people come in and go, ooh and ah about that uh, because it was powered by steam. Of course, you'd pull this handle and the steam would go through it and it'd make this loud noise. And so many people would remember, you know, getting up to go to school based on that mill whistle. Or in the afternoon when school was out, 
the mill whistle would blow. And it wasn't for schools. It was for people changing shifts. Wow. Um, but we also have samples of the soda bottle fabric that was made. Uh, we have, the, the, like I said, the, uh, the last mill whistle that was blown, uh, recorded. Um, and the cotton mill, for the community and for its employees, did a newsletter for many, many years. It was called The Spin It. And they had a person on staff that would help do that, and they would feature the ball team you mentioned or the bowling team or uh, Christmas things or, or events and people's babies born and uh, weddings and all that kind of thing, little newspaper. Uh, and we have every one of those uh, dating back to the 40s, and they're, they're, wow. they're bound. That's great. And so people can come. We even have uh, the ID cards uh, that people would use when they started keeping up with who's going to go through the time card deal. It's funny because those cards in those days had your Social Security number on it. <laughs> and so we had to go through all those cards and cross all those out oh. in today's idea of, of identity, identity yeah. theft. And yeah. so uh, it's, it's changed, but we have a lot of artifacts people would love to see. Now, my, my last question is, um, when are you going to write a book on this? <laughs> We have a county historian working on books. <laughs> I think this uh, would be a great book. Well, it, it probably would be. And to be honest with you, you know, I, I've got to find a way to sleep sometime. <laughs> uh, but it, it, Me it, too. It is a, a, a good project for us because we have helped write one book. It was a photo book that was done about Dyersburg, and, and the cotton mill is a big part of that. Um, and for right now, I, I'm just— enthralled with your podcast and how this information gets out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, someone hopefully out there listening to this is thinking right now, you know what, that would make a good book, and I'm going to contact him, and I'm going to uh, write it, because it's a, great, uh, it's a great study of business and technology and industry, you know, from the Depression all the way through to the 90s, um, and the life of that uh, mill really does mirror what a lot of people experienced in the United States. Well, and, and uh, you know, God does things in strange ways. And I feel like that, that he's put me on this earth at the right time to do these things and, and have my life experience kind of have a little piece of all of this. And so mm-hmm. um, just last week, uh, we talked about cotton. And somebody said, you need to get out and go watch how they pick cotton today. And so I went to halls and watched them pick cotton. Amazing what we're doing today because those tractors are GPS satellite directed. And, you know, whereas it takes uh, back in my day, it takes, you know, 30, 40, 50 people just to get half the field picked. There's four people and four tractors can pick the entire field and, and cut the stalks in the whole nine yards and get ready for the next uh, crop, you know, in a day. And it's, it's, the technology's changed, and it, it's, it makes you appreciate where you came from. Yeah, a farmer told me the other day that he programs his tractor using his iPhone before he even gets out of bed every right. day. So, right. yeah, it, the innovation taking place in agriculture is um, fascinating. It is. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing this story with us. You always bring us really great stuff, and I'm looking forward to the next one. Well, thanks for having me. I look forward to coming back. So now we're going to go from discovering things here about cotton and what happened in Dyersburg to discovering a little more about the behind the scenes of Discovery Park of America. Hello, I am Andrew Gibson with the Education Department here at Discovery Park of America. And today I'm with Russell Orr, Discovery Park's own in-house scientist. And today we are going to be learning about the T-Rex. That's right. And what about the T-Rex? Well, I came in here to solve a problem, Andrew. I want to address this idea that the Tyrannosaurus Rex was a scavenger. Um, You've probably heard this. A lot of people have heard it. Oh, the Tyrannosaurus Rex is a scavenger. I've read that there was even a lecture symposium uh, called Steak Knives, Beady Eyes, and Tiny Little Arms, a picture of the Tyrannosaurus Rex as a scavenger. I, however, side more with the uh, next lecture symposium called guess who's coming to dinner a portrait of the t-rex as a predator for for a a long while people would argue and by people i mean john r horner a few other paleontologists uh, would talk about how well if you're really big and you have teeth that can bite through bones to get the bone marrow from dead animals and you have itty bitty arms compared to other predators 
maybe you aren't a predator. Maybe your job is to show up after the thing is dead, or maybe after it's already mostly rotted, go up to it, bite through the, the, the bones to get the bone marrow, and then keep going. And since you're really big, you can scare other animals off of the carcass and eat it yourself. Uh, so the argument uh, was that uh, the T-Rex was a scavenger and possibly an obligate scavenger, one who mostly or uh, necessarily scavenged. Paleontologists have mostly rejected this today. They think that the uh, Tyrannosaurus rex acted the way predators do today. We would call this uniformitarianism, where you look at what's going on now and you use that as the model for the past, that if a T-Rex found an animal that was dead, terrific, a meal where that you don't have to fight for. But if it found the animal and it wasn't already dead, it could help it out to get to that point with its teeth. And then how does this compare to something like uh, like a velociraptor or anything like that? Well, uh, a velociraptor probably wouldn't come up to your kneecap, Andrew. Uh, velociraptors are not very big animals. Um, it it uh, the the thing the thing about dinosaurs is like remember we we have dinosaurs in our museum but we are Discovery Park of America is by no means the first museum to have these dinosaurs so uh, we we have our uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex for example with its head leaning forward instead of like at a forty five degree angle the way you see many many uh, T Rexes shown. Um, if we were the first museum or the first book or the first movie to show something, we would have uh, a really good advantage in shaping people's perceptions of what those things look like, right? Uh, with dinosaurs, and, and this is somewhat understandable because we've been studying them for so long and we did the best with what we had, but some of the first dinosaur specimens that were put up, some of the best uh, – some of the first uh, dinosaur conclusions that were reached were in error – and a lot of people, like millions of people who went to see the movie, millions of people who went to see the first T-Rex, millions of people who read a certain book, got the wrong idea. And we need to, you know, actually put some effort into uh, uh, moving on from these long-held and, and uh, strongly entrenched uh, misconceptions about dinosaurs. Now, were some of these misconceptions about dinosaurs, were they made out of haste by a certain person? Was it one famous paleontology? paleontologist, I'm sorry, um, or, you know, how did that happen? Well, uh, there are certain names that, that are ascribed to it. Um, I, I, I talk about John R. Horner or Jack Horner, and, and like, he's a really skilled paleontologist. There's no question about it. He also likes to be on TV. I don't think it's a, a bad thing that he advocated some of the uh, controversial theories about dinosaurs that he did because it forced us. It forced and by us, I mean the scientific community, it forced people to re-examine what they had presumed was true. That, you know, uh, we, we come home uh, every day, we have certain assumptions, and we don't ever bother to defend those assumptions or, like, really, really look at them. Uh, Jack Horner made us do that. Another uh, couple of guys who were heavily responsible for this problem would be Edward Drinker Cope and Charles Mars and their attempts to outdo each other during a, a period called the Bone Wars or Great Dinosaur Rush. So what do you mean they try to outdo each other? What were some of the things that they would do? Uh, well, uh, the thing about um, uh, science, especially back during the early days, was um, when, when children come in here to Discovery Park, if I look at a little girl and say, you know, you look like an Alice, I'm going to name you Alice. Come over here, Alice. And she says, my name is an Alice. She's right and I am wrong. Um, her name was set much, much earlier. Uh, when they were first digging up these new species that nobody had ever heard of, uh, whoever named it first, that was it. I'm never going to supersede a, a parent's name for their child. Well, whoever publishes this stuff first, they get they get naming rights. So uh, Edward Drinker Cope and Othniel Charles Marsh were skilled paleontologists, but in, in their efforts to outdo and preempt one another, they made some very serious miscalculations and, and flaws. And um, for, for a while, uh, Europe, which was, you know, the center of science and paleontology, looked at us as like the literal Wild West of paleontology. Oh, my gosh. Did you hear what they did? Oh, my goodness. Yet another rhinoceros-shaped beast that they've come up with another name for. Now, some people quit the field in disgust because of this. So, Russell, thank you for, for coming on and sharing more about this with us today. 
Um, and for all the young scientists listening out there, um, just remember that science is best when, when you're excited about the research, not getting your name on it first. Uh, you can find Russell, you can find some of our dinosaurs at Discovery Park of America. Uh, and thank you all for listening to Real Foot Forward, a West Nessie podcast. And we hope to see you here real soon. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.